Hello everyone, my name is James. This is the video number 29. <sighs> I'm trying to finish the game as fast as I can. I hope in this video and the next I'm going to finish it. If not, have a good time. Goodbye.
The philosophy of the Tao is one of the two great principal components of Chinese thought. There are, of course, quite a number of forms of Chinese philosophy, but there are two great currents which have thoroughly molded the culture of China, and they are Taoism and Confucianism. And they play a curious game with each other. Let me start by saying something about Confucianism, originating with Kung Fu Tzu or Confucius, uh, who lived approximately uh, a little after 630 BC. He's often uh, supposed to have been a contemporary of Lao Tzu, who is the supposed founder of the Taoist way. But it seems more likely that Lao Tzu lived later than 400, according to most modern scholars. Confucianism is not a religion. It's a social ritual and a, a way of ordering society. So much so that the first great Catholic missionary to China, Matteo Ricci, who was a Jesuit, found it perfectly consistent with his Catholicism to participate in Confucian rituals because he saw them as something of a kind of national character, as one might pay respect to the flag or something of that kind in our own times. But he found that Confucianism involved no conflict with Catholicism, no commitment to any belief or dogma that would be at variance with the Catholic faith. So uh, Confucianism is an order of society and involves ideas of human relations, including the government and the family, based on the principle of uh, what is called in Chinese Ren, although Jafu will notice that I never get my tones right, <laughs> uh, which is an extraordinarily interesting word. Um, I'm going to put some of these things on the whiteboard. Uh, this is the word in Chinese. And uh, it's often translated benevolence, but that's not a good translation at all. This word means human heartedness. That's the nearest we can get to it in English. And it was regarded by Confucius as the highest of all virtues, but one that he always refused to define. It's above righteousness and justice and propriety and other great Confucian virtues. And it involves the principle that human nature is a fundamentally good arrangement, including not only our virtuous side, but also our passionate side, also our appetites and our waywardness. The Hebrews have a, a term which they call the Yetzer Hara, Y-E-Z-R, Y-E-Z-E-R, H-A-R-A, which means the wayward inclination, or what I like to call the element of irreducible rascality that God put into all human beings and put it there because it was a good thing. It was good for humans to have these two elements in them. And so uh, a, a truly human-hearted person is a gentleman with a slight touch of rascality, just as one has to have salt in a stew. Confucius said the goody-goodies are the thieves of virtue, and meaning that to try to be wholly righteous is to go beyond humanity, to try to be something that isn't human. So uh, this gives Confucian approach to life and justice and uh, all those sort of things, a kind of queer humor. 
a sort of boys will be boys attitude, which is nevertheless a very mature way of handling human problems. It was, of course, for this reason that the Japanese Buddhist priests who visited China to study Buddhism, especially Zen priests, introduced Confucianism into Japan. Because despite certain limitations that Confucianism has, and it needs, it always needs the, the Tao philosophy as a counterbalance, Confucianism has been one of the most successful philosophies in all history for the regulation of governmental and family relationships. But of course, it is concerned with formality. Confucianism prescribes all kinds of formal relationships, linguistic, ceremonial, musical, in etiquette, the spheres of morals and for this reason has always been twitted by the Taoists for being unnatural. You need these two components you see and they play against each other beautifully in Chinese society. Roughly speaking you see the Confucian uh, way of life is for people involved in the world the Taoist way of life is for people who get disentangled. Now, as we know, in our own modern times, there are various ways of getting disentangled from the regular lifestyle, say, of the United States. If you want to go through the regular lifestyle of the United States, you go to high school and college, and then you uh, go into a profession or a business and you own a standard house and you raise a family and you have a car or two cars and uh, do all that jazz. But a lot of people don't want to live that way. And there are lots of other ways of living besides that. So you could say that those of us who go along with the pattern correspond to the Confucians. And those who are Bohemians or uh, bums or beatniks or whatever, don't correspond with the pattern, they are more like the Taoists. Because the Taoist is really, uh, actually in, in Chinese history, uh, Taoism is a way of life for older people. Uh, Lao Tzu, the name given to the founder of Taoism, means the old boy. And the legend is that he, when he was born, he was already had a, a white beard. <laughs> uh, so, it, it's sort of like this, that when you have contributed to society, when you've contributed children and brought them up, and uh, you have assumed a certain role in social life, you then say, now it's time for me to find out what it's all about. Who am I, ultimately, behind my outward personality? What is the secret source of things? And uh, the latter half of life is the preeminently excellent time to find this out. It's something to do when you have finished with the family business. I am not saying that that is a sort of unavoidable strict rule. Of course, one can study the Tao when very young because it contains all kinds of secrets in it as to the performance of every kind of art or craft or business or any occupation whatsoever. But it does, in, in, in China, in a way, it plays that role of a kind of safety valve for uh, the restrict, more restricted way of life that Confucianism prescribes. And the, the, there is a, a sort of type in China who's known as the old rogue. Um, he's a, a sort of intellectual above, uh, often found among scholars, who is admired very much 
and who uh, the type of character which had an enormous influence on the development of the ideals of Zen Buddhist life. He is one you see who goes with nature rather than against nature. Well now, first of all, I'm going to talk about ideas which come strictly out of Lao Tzu's book, The Tao Te Ching. And uh, of course, the basic thing in the whole philosophy is the conception of Tao. This word has many meanings and the book of Lao Tzu starts out by saying that the Tao which can be spoken is not the eternal Tao or uh, you can, there's a pun in there which you can't quite um, put into English you can't give all the meanings because the word Tao means both the way or course of nature or of everything it also means to speak so uh, the actual opening phrase of the book uh, following this uh, word Tao is this and the character is repeated again see and this this character means can be or can able something like that so the way which can be then give it its second meaning spoken described uttered but it also means the way that can be weighed not w-e-i-g-h but w-a-y-e-d you know you'd have to invent that word the way that can be traveled perhaps is not the eternal way in other words there is no way in which the Tao, or following the Tao, can, uh, there's no recipe for it. Uh, I, I can't give you any uh, do-it-yourself instructions, A, B, C, D, as to how it's done. It was like when Louis Armstrong was asked, what is jazz? He said, if you have to ask, you don't know. <laughs> now that's awkward, isn't it? But we can gather what it is uh, by absorbing certain atmospheres and attitudes connected with those who follow it. And from the art and the poetry and all the expressions and the anecdotes and stories uh, that illustrate the philosophy of the way. So this word then, the, the way or the course of things, is not, uh, you must understand this, uh, some Christian missionaries translated Tao as the Logos, taking as their point of departure the opening passage of St. John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. Now if you look up a Chinese translation of the Bible, it says in the beginning was the Tao. And the Tao was with God and the Tao was God same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was not anything made that was made. Uh, so they've substituted Tao there. Now that may make a very funny effect on a Chinese philosopher, because the idea of things being made by the Tao is absurd. <laughs> the Tao is not a manufacturer, and it's not a governor. It doesn't rule, as it were, in the position of a king. Although, the book, the Tao Te Ching, is written for many purposes, but one of its important purposes is as a manual of guidance for a ruler. And what it tells him is essentially, rule by not ruling. Don't lord it over the people. And so he says, the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when good things are accomplished, 
it lays no claim to them. In other words, the Tao doesn't stand up and say, I have made all of you, I have filled this earth with its beauty and glory, fall down before me and worship. The Tao, having done anything, you know, always escapes and is not around uh, to receive any thanks or acknowledgement because it loves obscurity. And Lao Tzu said the Tao is like water. It always seeks the low level which human beings abhor. So it's a very mysterious idea. Tao then is not really equivalent with any Western or Hindu idea of God because God is always associated with being the Lord. Even in India, the Brahman is often called the Supreme Lord, although that was the term more strictly applicable to Ishvara, the manifestation of Brahman in the form of a personal God. But Bhagavan, the Lord, Krishna, his, his song is the Bhagavad Gita, the song of the Lord. Uh, there's always the idea of the king and the ruler attached, but not in the Chinese Tao philosophy. The Tao is not something different from nature, from ourselves, from our surrounding uh, trees and waters and air. The Tao is the way all that behaves. And so the Chinese, the basic Chinese idea of the universe is really that it's an organism. And as we shall see when we get on to Zhuangzi, who is the sort of elaborator of Lao Tzu, uh, he sees everything operating together so that nowhere can you find the controlling center. There isn't any. The world is a system of interrelated components, none of which can survive without each other. Just as in the case of bees and flowers, you will never find bees around in a place where there aren't flowers, and you will never find flowers around in a place where there aren't bees or insects that do the equivalent job. And what that tells us secretly is that although bees and flowers look different from each other, they're inseparable. They, uh, to use a very important Taoist expression, they arise mutually. Uh, this is a, one of the great phrases from the second chapter of Lao Tzu's book, where he says, uh, this, this character means uh, to have or to be. And uh, this next one is a very important character in Taoist philosophy. It means no, negative, wu in Chinese, not to be. And then this curious expression, for which we don't have a really good corresponding idea in traditional Western thought, So, to be and not to be mutually arise. This character is based on the picture of a plant, something that grows out of the ground. So, you could say positive and negative, to be and not to be, yes and no. Light and dark arise and mutually come into being. There's none is uh, cause and effect, it's not that relationship at all. It's like the egg and the hen. So as the bees and the flowers uh, coexist in the same way as high and low, back and front, long and short, loud and soft, all those experiences are experienceable only in terms of their polar experience. So the Chinese idea of nature is that all the various species arise mutually because they interdepend. 
And this total system of interdependence is the Tao. It involves certain other things that go along with Tao, but this is this is this mutual arising is the key idea to the whole thing. And it is, uh, if you want to understand uh, Chinese and uh, Oriental thought in general, it is the most important thing to grasp. Because you see, we think so much in terms of cause and effect. We think of the universe uh, today in Aristotelian and Newtonian ways. that philosophy, the world is all separated. It's like a huge amalgamation of billiard balls. And they don't move until struck by another or by a cue. And so everything is going tuck, 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 all over the place. One thing starting off another in a mechanical way. But of course, from the standpoint of 20th century science, we know perfectly well now that that's not the way it works. We know enough about relationships to see that that mechanical model which Newton devised was all right for certain purposes. But it breaks down now because we understand relativity. And we see how things go together in a kind of connected net rather than in a, a chain of billiard balls banging each other around. So, in, in the philosophy of the Tao, uh, it is said, uh, it's always being said, this is, uh, you read this in every art book about Chinese art, that in Chinese painting, Man is always seen as in nature, rather than dominating it. You get a painting entitled, Poet Drinking by Moonlight. And you see a great landscape. And after some search with a magnifying glass, at last you see the poet <laughs> stuck away in a corner somewhere, drinking wine. Whereas if we painted the subject, Poet Drinking by Moonlight, the poet would be the most obvious thing in a picture. Uh, there he would be, dominating the whole thing, the landscape off somewhere behind it. But uh, all the Chinese painters put man... I mean, the painters of the great classical tradition, there are Chinese painters who specialize in family portraits, do these very formal paintings of someone's ancestor sitting on a throne. It's quite a different uh, category. But the Taoist-inspired painters, the Zen-inspired painters, have this view of man as an integral part of nature, something in it, just as everything else is in it, flowers and birds, and not there, sent into this world, commissioned by some sort of supernatural being to come into this world and farm it, and dominate it. So then, the whole conception of nature is as a self-regulating, self-governing, indeed democratic organism. But it has a totality. It all goes together, and this totality is the Tao. So then we move to a second term that is extremely important. Uh, the expression that Zidran is the it's the term that we translate nature when we translate Chinese. But this term expresses this whole point of view. It doesn't say nature, natura, uh, which means in a way class of things. It means literally self so. What is so of itself? What happens of itself? And thus spontaneity. And in the Tao Te Ching, early on, Lao Tzu says, 
the Tao's method is to be so of itself. Now, we might translate that automatic. Were it not that the word automatic has a mechanical flavor? Zirran, as this is called, or Shizen in Japanese, means spontaneous, yes. It, it happens as your heart beats. You don't do anything about it. You don't force your heart to beat. You don't make it beat. It does it by itself. Now figure a world in which everything happens by itself. It doesn't have to be controlled. It's allowed. The, uh, whereas, you might say, uh, the idea of God involves the control of everything going on. The idea of the Tao is the ruler who abdicates and lets all the people, trusts all the people to conduct their own affairs. Uh, to let it all happen. So, this doesn't mean, you see, that there isn't a unified organism everything is in chaos. It means that the more liberty you give, the more love you give, the more you allow things in yourself and in your surroundings to take place, the more order you will have. It is believed generally in India that when a person sets out on the way of liberation, his first problem is to become free from his past karma. The popular theory of karma, the word that literally means action or doing in Sanskrit, so that when we say that something that happens to you is your karma, it's like saying in English, it's your own doing. But in, in popular Indian belief, a karma is a sort of built-in moral law or a law of retribution such that all the bad things you do and all the good things you do have consequences which you have to inherit and so long as karmic energy remains stored up you have to work it out and what the sage endeavors to do is a kind of action which in Sanskrit is called nishkama karma Nishkama means without passion or without attachment, karma, action. And so, uh, whether he, whatever action he does, he renounces the fruits of the action, so that he acts in a way that doesn't generate future karma, because future karma continues you in the wheel of becoming samsara, the round, and keeps you being reincarnated. Now then, in that case, when the time comes that you start to get out of the chain of karma, all the creditors that you have start presenting themselves for payment. In other words, a person who begins, say, to study yoga is felt that he will suddenly get sick or that uh, his children will die or that uh, he'll lose his money or all sorts of catastrophes will occur because uh, the karmic debt is being cleared up and uh, it, there's in no hurry to be cleared up if you're just living along like anybody but if you embark on the spiritual life a certain hurry occurs and therefore uh, since this is known uh, it's rather discouraging to start these things The well, Christian way of saying the same thing is that if you plan to be to change your life, shall we say, to turn over a new leaf, you mustn't let the devil know, because he will oppose you with all his might if he suddenly discovers that you're going to escape from his power. So, for example, if you have a bad habit, say you drink too much, and you make a New Year's resolution that during this coming year you will stop drinking. That's a very, very dangerous thing to do because the devil will immediately know about it. Uh, and what will happen will be this. That he will confront you with the prospect of 365 drinkless days. 
and that will be awful, you know, just overwhelming. And you won't be able to make much more than three days on the wagon. So in that case, you compromise with the devil and say, just today I'm not going to drink, you see, but tomorrow maybe, you know, we'll go back. Then when tomorrow comes, you say, oh, just another day, let's try out, that's all. And the next day you say, oh, one more day won't make mu much difference. So you only do it for the moment and you don't let the devil know that you have a secret intention of going on day after day after day after day. <clears throat> uh, but of course, there's something still better than that. And that is not to let the devil know anything. And that means, of course, not to let yourself know. One of the many meanings of that saying, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth, is just this. And that was why in uh, Zen discipline, uh, a great deal of it centers around acting without premeditation. As those of you know who read Herigl's book, Zen in the Art of Archery, it was necessary to release the bowstring without first saying now. There's a wonderful story you may also have read by a German writer, Van Kleist, about a, a boxing match with a bear. The man can never defeat this bear because the bear always knows his plans in advance and is ready to deal with any situation. The only way to get through to the bear would be to hit the bear without having first intended to do so. That would catch him. And so this is one of the great, great problems in the spiritual life, or whatever you want to call it, is to be able to have intention and act simultaneous. By this means you escape karma and you escape the devil. So, uh, you might say that the Taoist is uh, exemplary in this respect. That this is getting free from karma without making any previous announcement of simply supposing we have a train and we want to unload the train of its freight cars. You can go to the back end and you can unload them one by one and shunt them into the siding. But the simplest of all ways of unloading is to uncouple between the engine and the first car and that gets rid of the whole bunch at once. And it is in that sort of way, you see, that the Taoist gets rid of karma without challenging it. And so, it has the reputation, you see, of being the easy way. There are all kinds of yogas and ways for people who want to be difficult. And uh, one of the great gambits of a man like Gurdjieff was to make it all seem as difficult as possible. Because that challenged the vanity of his students. If some teacher, some guru says, really, this isn't difficult at all, it's perfectly easy. Uh, some people will say, oh, he's not really the, the real thing. Uh, we want something tough and difficult. And I, when, when we see somebody starts out giving you a discipline that's very, very weird and rigid, people think, now there is the thing. That, that man means business. See? And so they flatter themselves by going to such a guy that they are serious students, whereas the other people are only dabblers and uh, so on. Uh, all right, if you have to do it that way, that's the way you have to do it. But uh, the Taoist is the kind of person who shows you the shortcut and shows you how to do it by intelligence rather than effort because that's what it is.
Taoism is in that sense what everybody is looking for. The easy way in, the shortcut, using cleverness instead of muscle. So the question naturally arises, isn't it cheating? When in any game, somebody really starts using his intelligence, he will very likely be accused of cheating. And to draw the line between skill and cheating is a very difficult thing to do. You see, the, the inferior intelligence will always accuse the superior intelligence of cheating. That's its way of saving face. You beat me by means that weren't fair. We were originally having a contest to find out who had the strongest muscles. And you know, we were pushing against it like this, 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 this. And uh, this would prove who had the strongest muscles. But then you introduce some gimmick into it, some judo trick or something like that, you see. And you're not playing fair. So in the uh, whole domain of ways of liberation, there are roots for the stupid people and roots for the intelligent people. And the latter are faster. This was perfectly clearly explained by Huinan, the sixth patriarch of Zen in China, in his uh, sutra, where he says the difference between the gradual school and the sudden school is uh, they both arrive at the same point, but the gradual is for slow-witted people and the sudden is for fast-witted people. Can you, in other words, find a way that sees into your own nature, that sees into the Tao immediately? And at the end of this morning's talk, I pointed out to you the immediate way. The way through now. When you know that this moment is the Tao, and this moment uh, is by its, considered by itself without past and without future, eternal, neither coming into being nor going out of being. Uh, there, there is nirvana. And there is a whole Chinese philosophy of time based on this. Uh, it hasn't, to my knowledge, been very much discussed by Taoist writers. It's been more discussed by Buddhist writers. But it's all based on the same thing. Dogen, the great 13th century Japanese Zen Buddhist, studied in China. And he wrote a book called Shobo Genzo. Eroshi recently said to me in Japan, that's a terrible book because it tells you everything. <laughs> it gives the whole secret away. But in the course of this book, he says, you don't, there is no such thing as a progression in time. The spring does not become the summer. There is first spring, and then there is summer. So in the same way, you now do not become you later. This is T.S. Eliot's idea in uh, Four Quartets, where he says that the person who has settled down in the train to read the newspaper is not the same person who stepped onto the train from the platform. And therefore also you who sit here are not the same people who came in at the door. These states are separate, each in its own place. There was the coming in at the door person, but there is actually only the here and now sitting person. And the person sitting here and now is not the person who will die. Because we are all 
a, a constant flux. And the continuity of the person from past through present to future is as illusory in its own way as the upward movement of the red lines on a revolving barber pole. You know, it goes round and round and round and, and the whole thing seems to be going up or going down, whatever the case may be. But actually nothing is going up or down. So when you throw a pebble into the pond and you make a concentric rings of waves, there is an illusion that the water is flowing outwards. And no water is flowing outwards at all. Water is only going up and down. What appears to move outward is the wave, not the water. So this kind of philosophical argument says that our seeming to go along in a course of time it doesn't really happen. The Buddhists say suffering exists but no one who suffers. Deeds exist but no doers are found. A path there is but no one who follows it and nirvana is but no one who attains it. So, in this way they look upon the continuity of life as the same sort of illusion that is produced when you take a cigarette and in the dark whirl it and the illusion of a circle is created, whereas there is only the one point of fire. The argument then is, so long as you're in the present, there aren't any problems. The problems exist only when you allow presence to amalgamate. There's a way uh, of putting this in Chinese, uh, which is rather interesting. They have a very interesting sign, this. It's pronounced Nyan. Japanese nen. And the top part of the character uh, means now, and the bottom part means the mind heart, the shin. And so this is, as it were, an instant of thought. In Sanskrit, they use it, uh, they use this character as the equivalent for the Sanskrit word shana. Then if you put, if you double this character, and put it twice, or three times, and I'll write the Chinese for ditto. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, nyan 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 means thought after thought after thought. Now the, the Zen master Joshu was once asked, what is the mind of a child? And he said, a ball in a mountain stream. What do you mean by a ball in a mountain stream? He said, thought after thought after thought with no block. So, he was using, of course, the mind of the child as the innocent mind, the mind of a person who's enlightened. One thought follows another without hesitation. The thought arises, it doesn't wait to arise. As when you clap your hands, the sound issues without hesitation. When you strike flint, the spark comes out. It doesn't wait to come out. And that means that there's no block. So, thought, 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 nyan, nyan, nyan describes what we call in our world the stream of consciousness. Blocking consists in letting the, the stream become connected, chained together, in such a way 
that when the present thought arises, it seems to be dragging its past. Or resisting its future. Saying, I don't want to go. <laughs> when then the connection, the dragging, it's better to call it, of these thoughts drops. You've broken the chain of karma. You would eliminate all meaning and have only senseless present moments. Up to a point that's true. So likewise, the chores of everyday life, they become intolerable. When everything ties together, all the past and the future, you feel it dragging at you every way. Supposing you wake up in the morning, and it's a lovely morning. Let's take... actually we're just lying in bed. <laughs> so the Taoist trick says, simply live now and there will be no problems. That's the meaning of the Zen saying, when you are hungry, eat. When you are tired, sleep. 
When you walk, walk. When you sit, sit. Rinzai, the great Tang Dynasty master, said, in the practice of Buddhism, there is no place for using effort. Sleep when you're tired, move your bowels, eat when you're hungry. That's all. The ignorant will laugh at me, but the wise will understand. <coughs> and so, also, the meaning of this wonderful Zen saying, uh, day, that's the character for the sun, day, that is, good day. Every day is a good day. <laughs> On condition, you see, that day, day is like nyan nyan. They come one after another and yet there's only this one. You don't link them. This, as I intimated just a moment ago, seems to be an atomization of life. Things just do what they do. The flower goes poof, and people go this way, go that way, and so on, and that's, that's, that's what's happening. It has no meaning, it has no destination, it has no value, it's just like that. And when you see that, you see it's a great relief. That's all it is. But then when you are firmly established in suchness, in that it's just this moment, you can begin again to play with the connections. Only you've seen through them. And, but now you see uh, they, they don't haunt you. Because you know that there isn't any continuous you running on from moment to moment who originated at some time in the past and will die at some time in the future. All that's disappeared. So you can have enormous fun anticipating the future, remembering the past and uh, playing all kinds of continuities. This is the meaning of that famous Zen saying about mountains are mountains. To the naive man, mountains are mountains, waters are waters. To the intermediate student, mountains are no longer mountains, waters are no longer waters. In other words, they've all dissolved into the point instant, to the kshana. But for the fully perfected student, mountains are again mountains and waters are again waters. In the philosophy of the Tao, uh, it is said, uh, it's always being said, this is, uh, you read this in every art book about Chinese art, that in Chinese painting, man is always seen as in nature rather than dominating it. You get a painting entitled, Poet Drinking by Moonlight, and you see a great landscape and after some search with a magnifying glass, at last you see the poet <laughs> stuck away in a corner somewhere, drinking wine. Whereas uh, if we painted the subject poet drinking by moonlight, the poet would be the most obvious thing in the picture. Uh, there he would be, dominating the whole thing, the landscape off somewhere behind him. But uh, all the Chinese painters put man, I mean, the painters of the great classical tradition, there are Chinese painters specialize in family portraits and do these very formal paintings of someone's ancestor sitting on a throne. It's quite a different uh, category. But the Taoist-inspired painters, the Zen-inspired painters, have this view of man as an integral part of nature, something in it, just as everything else is in it, flowers and birds, and not there, sent into this world, commissioned by some sort of supernatural being to come into this world and harm it, and dominate it. The whole conception of nature is as a self-regulating, self-governing, 
the democratic organism. But it has a totality. It all goes together, and this totality is the Tao. When we speak here in Taoism of following the course of nature, following the way, what it means is, is more like this. Doing things in accordance with the grain. It doesn't mean you don't cut wood, but it means that you cut wood along the lines where wood is most easy to cut. And you interact with other people along lines which are the most uh, genial. And this, then, is the great fundamental principle, which is called uh, Wu Wei, not to force anything. I think that's the best translation. It's often called not doing, not acting, not interfering, but not to force. Seems to me to hit the nail on the head. Like, don't ever force a lock while you bend the key or break the lock. You jiggle until it revolves. So Wu Wei is always to act in accordance with the pattern of things as they exist. Don't impose on any situation a, a kind of interference that is not really in accordance with the situation. For example, we have a slum and the people are in difficulty and so on and they need better housing. Now if you go in with a bulldozer and knock the slum down and you will put in its place uh, some architect's imaginative notions of what is a super efficient high-rise apartment building to store people, you create total mess, utter chaos. A slum has what we would call an ecology. It has a very complex system of relationships going in it, by which the thing is already a going concern, even though it isn't going very well. Anybody who wants to alter that situation must first of all become sensitive to all the conditions and relationships going on there. It's terribly important then to have this feeling of the interdependence of every form of life upon every other form of life. Uh, how we, for example, cultivate animals that we eat, uh, look after them and build them up and see that they breed in uh, reasonable quantities. We don't